Thanks to Eastside VR for having me for this. I'm um, very excited. This is a, a beginning of the public speaking season for me. I've got a few other events coming up, so this is me stretching my muscles, the old public speaking muscles, so please bear with me. Um, so accessibility in VR, this talk is going to be on accessibility basics and how they, are you guys hearing all this fine? Because I'm getting a weird echo. <laughs> accessibility basics and how they relate to virtual reality. So here's a little outline of the chat. There's going to be a little bit about myself, a little more than what we just covered, a little bit about accessibility in VR in general, some of the specific considerations that you need to consider when dealing in VR, uh, sight, hearing, mobility, and motor control. Uh, compliance, ADA and 508 compliance, uh, final thoughts, and then some final, final thoughts. And then at the end, we'll have links and beers and all the other kind of fun stuff. So a little bit about myself. Hello, my name is. My name is Brian Van Buren. I am the narrative designer at Tomorrow Today Labs. Uh, we are a indie gaming studio, about eight, nine people downtown Seattle. Down in Soto, uh, we are a games and middleware developer. We created Newton VR. I've uh, been working in VR personally for about a year now. Um, one of the fun things I like to tell people is my first real experience with VR where I realized it was going to work. It was an HTC Vive project. Uh, the two founders for our studio, Adrian and Keith, had, were stealth recruiting me for the company and brought me in to see the, go, see the Vive for the first time. And this was... I think July or August of last year. So the first thing, you go, you go through the first general things, the blue and various other things with, and tilt brush to show you to kind of increase your wonder factor. But one of the first things I came across was the job simulator demo. And the job simulator demo, the older demo, it's no longer there, but it's a demo where there's a cooking level. And in the cooking level, one of the tasks that you're given is to make a soup. Now, I, at a, since this thing was tracking me at the proper head height, the stove top as well as the, the, the uh, top of the top of the pot, the, the crock pot were at accurate height. So the stove top was here, the crock pot was here, the collider was there. I couldn't put objects into it. So I was trying to throw them and lob them up over into it. So I was having this, and of course the physics didn't work properly, so they're going straight up at an angle and nothing's quite making it in. And it was, it was amazing to me because I real, finally for the first time after seeing so many janky, you know, Oculus DK1, you know, steer with your head until you throw up versions of, of VR up to that point. This was the first time I said, wow, the immersion's there, the presence is there. I feel I'm here, I believe I'm in a space. And then it immediately hit me that absolutely no one was considering designing these spaces for people who had mobility impairments. And so that's kind of what got me down this road. Now, again, over a decade in video games, I worked at Nintendo of America for about six years, had a wonderful time there during the rise of the Wii, and I will get back to that uh, as we get further into it. 17 bits, Sierra, I started in testing, moved to games writing, and now into games design, narrative and UX design, because as I've learned, accessibility design is UX design. Uh, studied creative writing and journalism at the University of Arizona. Go Wildcats! Um, <laughs> But yes, I came from a writing background. I didn't study design, didn't study programming, just learned, picked up the skills and learned as I went along. Yeah, that's one of the fun things about being the independent side of things, uh, especially going from Nintendo of America, one of the largest publishers in the world, down to working to 17-bit games, which was a seven-person indie studio, where it's like, hey, no one knows how to do this, and you're sitting still. So suddenly the onus becomes on you to learn. So learning HTML and CSS and all the basics and basic coding up to JavaScript, learning how to, learning how to use wireframe, learning how to use all the design tools that were available. So speaking of University of Arizona, uh, when I was in college, uh, one of my favorite professors was an astronomy professor. And University of Arizona has one of the best space sciences schools in the world. And he started the, his first lecture of his school. He said, one of the first things they will teach you never to do is start any lecture with a definition. And then he proceeded to spend the next 15 minutes going over 20 different definitions for cosmological constants and things like that. So in respect for him, I will start this with a definition. Accessibility, what does it mean? Now there, are, I looked, 
I'm not going to give you the Webster's definition, or as I don't even remember what the specific Webster's definition is, but there are a lot of different pro ways you can think of accessibility. Uh, one of the ways that I, I, one of the various different definitions that I came across that was actually on Wikipedia of all things that I thought was very useful is the idea of accessibility is the ability to access a system or entity. So let's parse that even further because that is will helpful. The ability, which is the capacity that we have to interface. The access, how to interface with or use an object or a system, a generalized term or an abstract concept, an entity, a concrete or tangible thing. Now, let me take that and put it to, let me take that generalization and make it concrete for you. Here's an example of accessibility. The ability to access a system or entity. How did you guys get here? So the system you used is called transportation. You transported yourselves here in some manner whether it was the entity you used was, if in case you didn't walk here, which some of you may have, I don't know, this is a big office, is a vehicle in this, in some case, maybe a car, a bus, bicycle, hopefully not, it's kind of rainy out there. So access, you drove that vehicle or rode within that vehicle. And the ability is that you used your hands and feet to operate that car and used eyesight and sound cues in order to safely navigate. Now, that's, the ability to access a system or entity. Now let's take away some of those abilities and see how the system changes. So, limited ability. If you take away the feet or hands, transportation in vehicles is still possible, but you need assistive technology, such as hand controls, to give ability to access. So in my case, I drove here. My car is an automatic, so I don't have, but they do have, I have hand controls in my car, which allow me to drive without using my feet. They have ones for stick shifts, automatics, all sorts of other things. I have even seen it set up for people who maybe have limited motor control of their hands to be able to use, using, using you know, more of a joystick style setup. Um, so let's take, so if we take away that we still have access, we can still have access, we just need to make modifications in order to give the access. Now let's take away hearing. If you take away hearing, transportation vehicles is still possible, but greater attentiveness or different aids are necessary, such as proximity sensors, large mirrors, to give the same ability to access. It is you, st you can use your hand, you can drive normally as a person would, but you don't have the same cues coming in to let you know that you need to be safe, give you the information you need to be safe, so you need to pay extra attention, be extra attentive in order to be safe. Takeaway vision. Transportation without assistance is not, po without assistance from others is not possible without vision. Uh, it requires assistance to be added at the system level in order to give people the ability to access that system. Transportation is still available, however, a layer, a level of the assistance required has to be at the level of the system. So whether you need to take a metro, whether you need to hire a driver or whatever the case may be, you can still be transported, but your access is limited even further. You can't physically do it and you require someone else to do it for you. So, let me put my designer hat on, on accessing systems and entities. This is going to be my designer UX rant, so get ready for it. Systems and entities are often designed by and designed for able-bodied adults within the normal height variance. Not all people fit these parameters, and nobody does for their entire lives. Different ways to access systems may be necessary for those who don't. So. When we talk about able-bodied adults, being able-bodied to being, you know, a quadriplegic or completely paralyzed, that you exist along a continuum there. Nobody is ever truly able-bodied for the entirety of their lives. As we are, when we're young, we don't have the same motor control, strength, and ability as we do once we reach our peak age. And then at a certain age point, we begin to deteriorate. Our motor skills, our neuro, you know, our motor systems begin to break down. So, so, so able-bodiedness operates under a continuum, even if we are healthy, even if we never have injuries. Uh, let's get to injuries. You know, people who may be able to may be able to walk, but may have difficulty walking due to a knee or a leg or an ankle injury. These sorts of things 
uh, come into play. Uh, age, of course, you know, when, let's see, what's the other one? Normal height variance, oh boy. So, uh, normal height variance is something that's very near and dear to my heart, being a wheelchair user trying to function in a room scale VR space. Uh, most, not only do, is your, do you change throughout your lifestyle in terms of height variance, but when you're dealing on the extreme ends, being extremely tall can be as great a challenge as being extremely short. So, now there are different ways to access these systems. Here are some ways that you may or may not have thought about as being accessibility aids. Ramp, in, that in the real world we have to use in order to have access. Ramps, elevators, glasses and contact lenses, wheelchairs, lifts, hearing aids, footstools, grabbers, baby carriers, automatic garage door openers. Let me tell you, I can't open that damn garage. It's too heavy. It's not designed for someone, city, for someone to lift city. These are entities you may not consider to be an accessibility aid, but they are. And for some people, the accessibility aid may be what allows them to function within life, normal life. So let's talk about software accessibility. Now we've gotten past the basic physical stuff. So accessibility software in software is already robust, but if you didn't know you needed those options, you would never know about them. Most people don't know that the Microsoft Office suite has, has text-to-speech, has the ability to do plug-and-play on eye-tracking software, has the ability to use very, has color blindness modes, has all these, things, all these different things in there because people just don't use them. Companies like Microsoft, Google, and, R, and Oracle, and those all have hyperlinks to the web pages towards that actually are to the departments that are specifically created to come up with and make sure there are accessibility options in their software to test them out and make them available to everyone and come up with new ones all the time. So accessibility in gaming it exists. It isn't quite as robust as we find in other sorts of software because it's not required, although more on that later. But there are plenty of resources that are available to developers and designers. Would games like Hue or Legend of Grimrock have accessibility options, it does get a lot of positive press. I think if you go online and do a Google search for news articles on Hue, you'll find that if you look at the top 10, at least five of them are going to be talking about the color blindness option, being a game that's primarily based on color. Well, they had to do a lot of work to make sure that the color blindness option functioned properly on that so that people who are colorblind can still play the game. They got more press and more goodwill out of that. Legend of Grimrock is one of my personal favorites because this is an example. While it was a game that was in early access, it was a dungeon crawler, it was an early access Steam game. And in the forums, a gentleman had asked, was asking one of the developers if they had planned to do, uh, put in the ability to map the, uh, to map controls to different buttons. And he said, no, I wasn't really planning on it. Why do you ask? And I said, oh, I'm a quadriplegic and I usually have to use, I use one of the wands in order to type and it makes it easier if I can set up my own control scheme. But that's fine. I know you guys are busy. The very next post was the guy saying, you know what? I'm going to add that in right now. And it's only going to take me about a half hour. And that post, of course, went, got, went viral, went onto Reddit, made it onto Kotaku and was busted around and suddenly, their, uh, their pre-order, their early access numbers shot through the roof. You know, not, and it's still a fun little game. You know, it's just, it's a dungeon crawler. But it's a fun little game, but something where just doing that one little, doing something helps pre present an image of you as positive human beings who are trying to do good in the world and make it same thing. When I was working at 17-bit games uh, at PAX one year, we, uh, we were just finished uh, Galaxy of the Dimensional was the game. We had finished the console version and we had just started work on the PC version. And myself and one of the engineers were manning the booth at PAX. And we had, that discussion had come up earlier in the week of the, uh, on whether or not we were planning on putting mappable control schemes into the, into the, the PC version. And they said, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'll, maybe if we get around to it. And lo and behold, a quadrupleted gentleman came up and asked us if we planned to do that. It's like, oh, this game looks really fun. Are you guys going to set it up so that we can, because it's easier for people. I kind of grabbed him and said, I don't know. Are we going to do that? And shoved him right in front of him. And he literally went home after his shift was over, spent four man hours and put it into the game. 
and now Galaxy the Dimensional on PC, you can, you can set whatever control scheme. It's that easy. Okay, I don't want to pretend it's not that. It's that easy. I know some cases, this programming, programming is difficult, but it's worth the man hours. Now, special considerations are required due to the unique medium of VR. Now, as I've talked about all these accessibility things, let's think about the specific needs of the current VR systems. So, VR systems and entities have four accessibility components I want you to be thinking about. And these are, as I go through these, believe me, these are not all the, these are not, this is not a complete list, nor a complete list of fixes for them. These are just ones that I've encountered and that I've come up, I've come across, and ones that, ways that I think, and then ways I've seen other developers attempt to fix these problems. So, sight. We have impairments like bad eyesight or color blindness. These are problems that can, that ha, that may, well, these issues can deal with various things like, like reading text on screens where using colors in order to, as a definition marker, uh, other sorts of things, hearing impairments. People who may have issues with hearing. One of the important things with is stereo and 3D sound in VR being, uh, helping to create a greater sense of immersion in the space because you hear sounds around you and it tends to lead you. Well, if you have hearing problems, that gets that, and audio is the only cue that you're using in order to make, in order to, to direct attention, that's a problem. Motor impairment, so limited control of hands or arms or missing digits. So not everyone has, you know, people can still grasp controllers but not have complete control of their hands. In some instances, there are plenty of people who have, you know, some manner of partial quadriplegia or maybe missing digits. If you only have, if you're missing these two fingers and you have a Vive game and the only way to access it is through the trigger controller, and I talked to a guy about this on Reddit, he had a very difficult time controlling using the Vive controller because he didn't have these two fingers. It was grasping them was very uncomfortable for him. And mobility impairments, impairments like paraplegia, quadriplegia, missing limbs, such as missing limbs, and by missing limbs I mean legs, or, or being bedridden. That I'll get to as an, it was an interesting case that I hadn't even thought of, and then when it was brought up to me, it, had to do a lot of thinking about that one. So, sight considerations. So, head mounted displays are the central feature of VR, whether it's a mobile, whether it's the gear, all, VR, rest in peace while it burns, uh, daydream, cardboard, or whether it's a tethered, whether it's the Vive, the Oculus, or the PlayStation VR, the, the display is mounted on your head and covers your field of vision out to 120 degrees, I believe, and this and as you move your head, it tracks your head and, and draws objects around you. Because vision is the primary thing, if you have any sort of vision impairments, this is going to cause problems. So let's, so color blindness, you know, text in VR, uh, best as part of the environment, not fixed to a viewpoint for nausea reasons, uh, text guys, saleable or lot. These are basic things to take in account of. So, it, so for basic software ability, you always want to take into consideration color blindness, basic software ability, text. You know, you always want to take into concern motion sickness in VR. As concerns should not be discounted. So, here's some specific examples and fixes. Color blindness. You can always use Color Oracle to check, and but there are other fixes that are design related that you should be thinking of. So, making sure that in-game buttons are different shapes if the same color. Make sure that buttons flash if they need to be pressed as, a, as an indicator they need to be pressed. Uh, direct, direct based on shape, not color. Press the square, if, so for an auditory cue, to press the square button instead of the red button. Text. Static text is a means of conveying important information. This is something we've been doing in video gaming for years. VR, instead of, instead of having static walls of text that confuse everyone, Let's make it environmental text. So, so as we've seen on in Fantastic Contraption and various other games, signage within the space works just fine. Large text. Um, I love the idea of 
for a journal having a physical book object that you reach back, pull forward, and that deals with any sort of sight, any sort of uh, blurring issues because you move as close or as far away and make it as comfortable as you need it to. Um, text should be large and simple. Think about a stop sign. Think about the iconography of a stop sign. Large letters, large shape, very simple. Symbols as well as text. Understandable icons and substitute for words. Tilt brush. Love tilt brush. There's so much about tilt brush. They do wonderfully well. But if you ever try to read the text below the iconography on their, on their uh, little ideal, ideal wheel, it's... You, I, even I, and I have perfect 20-20 vision, have to hold it very close to be able to read it. Luckily, they use iconography that's very easy to understand. So remember, iconography is, it can help. It's not it can be used instead or as a substitute for words. So hearing considerations, like I was bringing up earlier, audio is very important in VR. Part of having the ambient soundscape, which creates a deeper layer of immersion, part of using audio in order as a cue to direct attention or to show people what they should pay attention to or to use uh, positional emitters to let people feel like that's where that noise is coming from. So any sort of hearing loss, whether it's hearing loss in one ear, hearing loss in both ears, uh, tinnitus, uh, any uh, varying levels of hearing loss, these can all cause problems, and a basic hearing aid may not fix all of them. So, one of the thoughts is to make sure, one of the basics in the, one of the gaming basics is to make sure that you never have audio cues all by themselves. Make sure there's also an accompanying visual cue. Uh, don't rely on positional audio cues. Hearing loss in one ear can make stereo hearing impossible. And if conveying data through dialogue alone, subtitles or visual reinforcement is required to go along with it. So examples for VR. Audio cues, again, never to use positional audio alone. Cues should be comprehensive with visual and haptic cues to draw attention. Static audio emitters need special attention. If you are going to have static audio emitters, remember to try to never have zero sound in one channel if you're doing stereo. Always have some sort of sound that increases as you turn towards an object, but never have zero and a hundred. And subtitles. We still need to figure out a way to properly make subtitles work in VR. I have seen a few mock-ups, but at this stage, no one has properly hit dialogue subtitles in VR in a way that feels correct. Um, that's on us as VR designers and developers, we need to figure this system out ourselves. Um, I don't personally know what it is and I haven't seen anything that works yet. So, uh, but eventually we're going to need to figure out how subtitles work in VR. Uh, if you are going to use subtitles, same sort of thing, try to keep it static with the environment, something, a bubble hanging over a head, something along those lines. Creating music with using VR hardware is awesome. There was a VR hackathon I was at not that long ago where they had created a setup where the game, you had several different positional audio emitters and, as you, and you played them as though you were playing drums. And as you played them, then a new one showed up and you had to follow it and create a pattern in space while doing so. This was incredibly enjoyable, a lot of fun problem with it was is that since they were positional as you went along if you weren't turning your head it you would lose you could lose it and in fact it, if you were aimed the wrong way you would lose the you would lose it entirely so that's something to keep in mind so if you can set and move those audio emitters this is something i told them uh, also if your experience is going to be primarily audio based User test it with people with various different levels of hearing. Don't just have people with 100% hearing. Um, there are cool audio games, rhythm-based games in VR, but people who have hearing problems will may not be able to use them. Motor control considerations. So. Whether using the Vive or Touch or Move controllers or using a gamepad, the basic considerations for accessibility still apply. The ability to change button mapping or control schemes, and the making sure that your control schemes are as simple and easy to use as possible 
for a Vive touch or move, the ability to use a single controller rather than requiring the player to use both to, to use objects, and interactive environments, in, interactive objects environments should be properly spaced and easily to interact with, and easy to interact with. This is very important in VR. So, some examples. Trees, treat the Vive touch move like a console or keyboard. Control mapping is a must. If you only use one button for interactions, make sure that you can change it. Once again, going back to my friend who had lost his two fingers. The, the Vive project he was working on, the only way you interacted was with the trigger button. There were no other buttons at work. It was basically you open the menu or you use the trigger to pick up this hog pick things up. It would have been very easy to set it up so either the grip buttons or the thumb pad could do that. Same thing with the Vive, same thing with the touch controllers, same thing with the PlayStation Move. Make, being able to swap them, to swap the various control schemes is very important for people. Um, designing so controls can only be used by one controller only. There are people who have one arm. One of the first, there was an article I read uh, one of the first articles I read that really got me thinking about thinking outside of the box of mobility impairments in VR was Andy Moore from, uh, from Radial Games, who was working on Fantastic Contraption. And one of the original, the original demo had a, had a uh, one of the actions we required, required you to use both hands to do it. And one of the artists had told them, well, what if a person only had one arm? They couldn't complete this tutorial. And initially, the rest of the team was like, well, yeah, how often is that going to happen? And he said, no, we need to completely redesign this now because this could happen. Let's go back to Tilt Brush. Again, love these guys to death. But because you have to point in order to make selections, that makes it a two controller scheme, which very easily could be a one controller scheme if you just held down and selected using the thumb pad. If you spun, pressed down, and while holding down, then made the actual selections. That would be easy to do, but instead it's designed this way. That's the way it's going to eventually make its way. That's the way that control scheme is eventually going to make its way into other sorts of software. I've got a whole long explanation on why Tilt Brush is, both the, fu is, is the future of interaction models. Um, so, using Wii Waggle to reduce the impact of mo limited motor control. So, when I was working at Nintendo, uh, I was, was during the heyday of the Wii controller, which, was, which, as a motion controller, did not have a high degree of fidelity. It was very limited fidelity. Um, even once we had the Wii Motion Plus gyroscope attached on this pin left, it still had a very limited level of fidelity. But what that did, interestingly enough, was make certain games that you would, certain experiences or games that you would think wouldn't be accessible were accessible. I worked in our compliance department for a few years, so I always had to test the various different third party softwares that came through. I kicked ass at dancing games. I just stomped the floor. If we ever needed someone to get 100% on a specific dancing game, I was the one they called. And it wasn't because I, and it was because I was actually just following the basic motions that it was telling you to do. Now, if you were a person who was actually dancing right along and doing that, you may not, one, you may not be able to get it right, but you, know, you could enjoy it by adding that additional layer. For me, I could still participate, I could still score, I could still have a great time, I could kick your ass at that game any day. Just Dance I was awesome with. If I was trying to play Just Dance for the Kinect, I would fail any moment, any, every single time because the Kinect did not had too fine a sense of control in order, and it was, too, it was trying to be too accurate. So, one of the things we learned from the Wii is that if you fudge it a little bit, if you try to make it so that you're not trying to do massive looping, sweeping cuts, or do these sorts of things that may be challenging. Sorry. So, sometimes having too high a level of fidelity is going to cause, having a low level of fidelity can one, make things more fun, for a larger group of people, and two, allow people to go as wild and wacky and realistic a physical behavior as they want to and still have someone who can't complete the physical action still, still be able to score right alongside and have fun. Steam VR tracking. This, I was at Steam Dev Days last week. Steam, day, Steam VR tracking is the valve system that allow, the, of sensors and lighthouses that allows for 
that, that is the system that's used to track the position of the, of the Vive HMD and the Vive controllers. They have made both the technology to create lighthouses and to create sensors available for sale, royalty free for anyone to use. This, what this allow, because of this, and this is something that I immediately thought of, you can create special needs controllers for people who have limited motor controls. So, the Able Gamers charity, one of the things that they do, one of the main reasons why they take money is they are creating adaptive technology for people to use who may, for people with quadriplegia, paraplegia, or any other sort of physical in order to play video games. This opens that up to anyone. If you have a 3D printer and you buy the gear, the API sticks right in. You can plug and play any of these things. So you can create controllers, you know, any sort of controllers that you want. Controllers with larger buttons for people who may need them because they may only have, may not have fine motor control of their digits. You can use ones that have straps for people who have no control over their, who cannot grip them so they can still hold the controller. And so mobility consideration. This is near and dear to my heart. Mobility exists on a continuum. Paraplegic has different needs than a quadriplegic who has different needs than someone who's bedridden. Uh, room, scale space, room scale places camera height at user height. For the HTC Vive, the Oculus Rift does this as well with the Oculus Touch controllers. And PlayStation, Move, PlayStation VR does this, but to a lower level of fidelity. This may cause accessibility issues and the environment is not designed for short, or, for short or tall users. I wrote an entire article about a deeper dive on this at, at VR in Flux. There's a link to it in here. Go read that up. So, for people who are bedridden, this was something that was brought up after I wrote that article in the comment section of a lady up in Vancouver, British Columbia, who has... Uh, Several had fractured spinal column and cannot sit up or stand for any period of time without excessive pain. She basically spends her entire life in a bed. And she is so excited about VR. But the thing we couldn't think, and I talked to uh, a few other people about this, is if we, we put her in an HGC Vive system as it was now, she'd always be looking at the ceiling. So what do we do with that? Well, if we can come up with a way, and I've already talked to, talked to a few people at Unity about this, so the capacity to set the cam, to actually alter the level of the camera rig so that you could be laying down and still have it seem as though you're standing and still have the controllers out in front of you so that you're actually, instead of looking at the ceiling, you're looking ahead of you. That is a consideration which I would love to see come in. So here's a few examples fixes. So. Make your UI UX elements customizable within the VR space. Allow for placement of panels, levers, and control elements. Let the user put controls where it is most comfortable for them. Uh, I had talked with a gentleman online who was working on a, I tell this story a lot because I love, the, I love this idea. It's, a, it's basically you're a steampunk dirigible pilot. And the idea behind it is you'd have a large steering wheel and lots of levers and lots of pulleys and ballast things and or and the idea being that there was this kind of constant frantic movement that was going around that allowed you to that that made you you know have this very energetic experience but the problem he was having was he was he had placed a number of the levers a number of the buttons up on the ceiling and you know they would be in a position where a person from a seating position or a child or someone else simply wasn't going to be able to reach those things so he said, what could we do? It's like, I really like this. And I said, why on earth are you tethering your UI in that manner? Why you have a VR space, a steampunk VR space. Let people put things where they want them to go. Let them put a button on the wall to make the entire panel on which those gears and levers drop down and set that at a height that's comfortable for you. This is one of the things we could do in VR that we couldn't do before. In a regular video game, are you going to be in a, in a space combat, your cockpit, in a space combat simulator, your cockpit set. In VR, you can change the cockpit if you want, move objects to where you want them to. These are the sorts of things we should be thinking about doing in VR. Let's see. Um, 
determine what mobility consideration works best for your project. I listed a few different ones, changing the camera height, uh, bypassing unusable content, making sure your design is such. There are different considerations that have their own problems. So for instance, one of, the, one of the ways to deal with this is to change the camera height, to allow the user to set the camera height at the beginning of the project, so you, at the beginning of the, the experience, so that you know where you are. But if you, one of the problems with that is that when you do, if you move, if you do that, the floor still exists where it exists. So if you drop objects and have to lean over and try to pick them up, you're still going, your controller will be smacking into the floor. Uh, there was a, a, a VR a VR archaeology, which was one of the hackathon projects I had worked with, which was a great idea. The idea being that you would go into a VR, you'd do a VR archaeological expedition where you would go in and go to the ground and clean, you know, and and brush away things, and you would you you would reveal various different you know archaeological finds. Like if you went into a, a space and found a fire pit and found broken broken pots and whatever that would be revealed to be the kitchen and then suddenly the kitchen itself the 3d model of the kitchen as it appeared 5,000 years ago would appear and then you go to the next room and find you know you'd find bedding and, and animal dung and that would be the stable and slowly you would build up the space and I thought this was great I can't wait to try it. and then I went in and the camera was set at the, at a natural height I went down bang and just kept smacking the controller on the ground and I was never going to be able to dig into it now Changing the, for that one, changing the camera height would not have helped because that, I would have put it up even higher to be at a more standing, and it really wouldn't have hit it. Scaling spaces is another option. That is making the space larger or smaller based upon the size of, based upon where the camera height is. But that is performance intensive. As I've, everybody I've talked to is terrified of that because it's a lot of work on the back end. Oh, another thing, try to keep near field interactions in the near field. So by near field interactions, what I mean is, you know, pressing buttons, moving levers, all those fun things that feel satisfying or enjoyable in VR. Try to keep them close. When you, if you force people to move around within the space in order to do it, it kind of slows, the, it, it, it breaks flow and it can be very difficult, especially for someone like myself. If I have to turn around with the Vive controllers in my hand, then I have to go by the palm of my hand and then turn like this. Usually I just end up putting them in my lap, but if I have to hold on to a button to hold on to an object, that's a problem. So let's talk about uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act and, 508, and Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. So these are the laws in the United States. There are other laws. The, the European Union and England and several other countries have their own set of laws. Employers must make reasonable accommodations. Now, no one's going to say that if you're in a job that you physically can't, that a person in a wheelchair, if a quadriplegic can't change, can't physically do the job, they're probably not going to require your training program to do that. But if you're in a desk job, you probably are going to, if your job is a quote unquote desk job, if you work in tech, if you work in anything that doesn't require, you know, ex, a, 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 that isn't in the labor field, chances are you, your training software will need to have accessibility options. Now, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act is technology and technology, including software used by the government, must have accessibility accommodations. If you are looking to sell your program to the state, to local, state, or federal government, it will need to it will need to pass Section 508 compliance. Period. That's no joke. So that's part of the reason why Microsoft and Oracle and Google and all these companies have such robust accessibility options in all of their software. And if you guys work for Microsoft, you're aware of this fact because they're selling it all to the government, because the government will not buy it otherwise. Not just the United States government, the UK, the British Commonwealth governments, the European Union governments, and it goes on and on. So what does this mean for VR? I've talked to a few people at the, both, uh, both on the federal and state level. There is currently no VR specific considerations in regards to either, in regards to either the eight, the, uh, section 1 of the ADA or Section 508 of the Labor Act. But as adoption of VR hardware increases, VR and AR and, A and, A and 
augmented reality and mixed reality will likely have their own requirements, and those will impact primarily productivity, education, medical, and training software, anything that federal, state, or local governments would use. We should be the ones driving the accessibility design conversation. We are part of the VR software industry. We are the experts. We should be the ones finding the solutions and including them rather than having the solutions forced upon us by a government agency later. This is a clarion call, people. That's why we need to do this stuff now. So, final thoughts. And these numbers, I hate them, but they are numbers that exist. When analysts talk about a $120 billion VR market by 2024, you can go ahead and snicker. Uh, remember that the majority of that will be in commercial software, not entertainment software. Commercial software will fall under the ADA Section 508 umbrella. The consumer install base could be over 80 million by 2020. The larger the consumer install base, the greater the chance your product will reach someone with accessibility needs. If they can't use it, they will buy another product which meets those needs. Here's some final, final thoughts. As with all things VR related, we don't have all the answers yet. Future control schemes, hand-based control schemes, genuine haptics, as you'll see later, as you'll see later, uh, will open more doors but also add more accessibility issues. We are still in the early stages of VR. We don't even have best practices yet, much less accessibility best practices. Let's discover them together and share them with everyone. Kumbaya. <laughs> and finally, mercifully, I'm going to put, my, put that disgusting designer UX hat back on and tell you that thinking about accessibility makes you a better designer and designing for accessibility creates a better product. That's the truth. Shameless plug! If you're gonna be at VRDC, you can come check out the talk I'm going to be giving. It's on the November 2nd. I'll be talking about a lot of these same things, only with three other people on the panel. So, so you won't have to listen to just me for this long. Okay, and also here's some resources for you guys to use. Uh, check it. Uh, GameAccessibilityGuidelines.com is a wonderful resource for people uh, looking for accessi accessibility design help with video games. Able Gamers Charity is a tremendous organization, not only helping to drive awareness of accessibility needs in VR, but also to help create, uh, help to create one-off or, in some cases, production-style uh, adaptive adaptive hardware for people with various disabilities to use. Um, shameless plug from a boss, uh, user is disabled, solving for physical limitations in VR. That's also on the VR Influx blog that I write for, so shameless plug from my boss. Uh, Road to VR, the article with Katie Good, uh, who created, tri from Triangular Pixels, who created Unseen Diplomacy, which is the first VR game to have accessibility options. And then the edit Polygon editorial I was telling you about earlier by Andy Moore. If you guys want access to this, let, you know, let me know, give me your email address, I will give you access to this and put it up online so everyone can get, get a look at these slides and get a look at these various links. And let's see, and that's pretty much it. <laughs>